Right. Uh, so, hi, I'm Daniel Franca from Akamai, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, cryptographic security for NTP. Uh, so, for starters, uh, NTP, who cares? Uh, well, I'd like to thank the anonymous reviewer uh, who recommended that this talk be accepted and succinctly hit the nail on the head with an answer to that question. Uh, NTP itself is not a high profile, high profile network protocol, uh, but it does underpin pretty much everything else, and that makes it an important target for scrutiny. Uh, well, what is everything else? Uh, well, a lot. Uh, take this list with a grain of salt. I came up with a few of these things off the top of my head. A lot, of them, a lot more of them come from grepping the corpus of RFCs for the word timestamp. Um, so there's probably a lot I left out. Um, apparently, we can now add DNS to that list. Um, and, uh, uh, but this stuff is mostly boring. I mean, X509 is mostly just used for TLS, and who cares about that? Um, so let's talk about something interesting instead. Let's talk about sharks. So a few years ago, uh, there was a biology grad student at uh, UCSD uh, who was tracking the migrations of a school of great white sharks. Uh, his team had tagged the sharks with GPS trackers, which were periodically sending timestamp location data to a server in their lab. Uh, unfortunately, that server's NTP daemon was misbehaving, and as a result, its clock was fast. Uh, now, as far as anybody knows, this was not the result of an attack. Uh, maybe it was a bug, maybe it was misconfiguration, maybe there was a problem with the upstream servers. I don't think anybody ever got to the bottom of that. Uh, but anyway, uh, as a result of its clock being fast, the tracking program thought that the data it was receiving was old, uh, so it applied dead reckoning to infer the shark's current position. Uh, this placed the sharks, uh, jumped them if you will, uh, just offshore of a popular beach. Uh, the grad student sees this and, leaping into action, uh, phones up his friend a lifeguard. Uh, mass panic predictably ensues, the beach gets evacuated and shut down until some time later when a very embarrassed grad student realizes his mistake. Uh, so the moral of this story is that when you think of NTP, don't just think of your common desktop applications, don't just think of your TLS server, don't just think of high frequency trading. Uh, there are more things that depend on NTP than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Uh, and when it breaks, it can break in some very surprising ways. Uh, so, having established the importance of the integrity of our system clock, it follows that we'd like our NTP data to be authenticated. Uh, and here's what's available for that today. Uh, so, the overwhelming majority of NTP users are running it without any authentication at all, and the few of you in this audience who are an exception, you know who you are. Um, NTP does support a symmetric authentication mode, which basically just hacks on a Mac on the end of every packet. Um, it's somewhat broken, but the more important issue is that being symmetric, it's only useful to you if you've arranged in advance to share a key with your server operator, and obviously this doesn't scale the real-world deployment. Um, finally, NTP supports something called AutoKey, uh, which is an attempt at supporting public key authentication. Um, but as I will return to in a bit, um, it is thoroughly broken. Uh, to quote Harlan Sten, uh, who maintains the NTPD reference implementation, uh, if you're using AutoKey, you should stop. Uh, now, before I venture any further into the weeds of NTP authentication schemes, I'm going to need to explain a bit about how NTP works. Uh, this is a topic which could easily fill a college semester, uh, but here is a super abridged version with just enough information so that you can follow the rest of this talk. Uh, so here on the slide you see an NTP packet header. Uh, this header can be followed by some extension fields and then by a MAC, uh, but in most usage neither one is present, so this header is the entire packet. Uh, the four fields that are interesting for our purposes are highlighted in yellow. Um, NTP's basic time, basic time synchronization algorithm involves four timestamps, which I've laid out here. Uh, there's also a fifth one, the reference timestamp, uh, but for, our, for today's purposes, you can ignore it. Uh, but these four timestamps represent a chronological sequence of events. Uh, request is sent, request is received, response is sent, response is received. Uh, note that only T1 through T3 appear in the packet. Uh, T4 never crosses the wire. Um, it's, just something, it's just measured by the client when the response arrives. Uh, so given these four timestamps, uh, there are a few important values we can compute. Uh, one is the network round trip time. Uh, T4 minus T1 represents the whole time the request was in flight. Uh, T3 minus T2 represents the time the server spent processing it. So subtract that part out and you're left with just the time due to network latency. Uh, the statistic we really care about, though, here is theta, uh, which represents the offset between the server's clock and the client's clock. 
Uh, we can estimate theta as I've shown here, uh, but this equation incorporates a key assumption, uh, which is that network latency is symmetrical. Uh, in other words, that our request and our response each took the same amount of time to cross the network. Uh, of course, no matter how good our authentication scheme is, uh, it's quite possible for a network adversary to mess with this assumption by delaying packets in one direction but not in the other. Uh, so here we have this lambda statistic, which is also called the synchronization distance. Uh, which basically represents our maximum error. It represents how far off our estimate might get as a result of this. Uh, so the first term here, delta over two, uh, represents the worst case of network asymmetry, uh, where one leg is instantaneous and all the delay occurs on the other leg. Um, epsilon captures a few relatively minor sources of error. Uh, one thing that goes into epsilon is that our clock get time call uh, takes a non-zero amount of time to return, uh, so every timestamp has some inherent impre imprecision in it. Um, second is that our local clock might drift a little bit while the request is in flight, um, so our measurement of round trip time might itself be a little off. Um, but in practice, the delta over two term dominates this equation, even if you're running over a fast LAN, and epsilon is pretty insignificant. Uh, so moving on to the mode field, uh, the overwhelming majority of NTP operates in client-server mode. Uh, the client will send a mode three request, and the server will send back a mode four response. Uh, but NTP also supports a symmetric mode and a broadcast mode. Uh, in symmetric mode, two systems synchronize to each other. Uh, in this case, you can either have both systems explicitly configured to talk to each other, in which case they'll both send each other mode one packets, um, or else one system can be configured to automatically peer with any system which sends it a well-authenticated mode one packet, um, in which case the packets it sends back will be in mode two. Uh, in broadcast mode, the client will start out by performing some, some small number of normal client server volleys with the broadcast server in order to establish what the network latency is. Uh, but thereafter, just passively listen for time broadcasts without sending out any further requests. Um, I am not a fan of this mode, and I don't really know anybody who uses it. Um, modes six and seven are used for status queries. Uh, they use a completely different packet format than I've shown you here. Uh, mode six is quasi-standard, mode seven is non-standard. Uh, mode seven is, response, is what's largely responsible for the massive DDoS amplification attacks you're, you're probably familiar with. Um, so, as I said earlier, uh, symmetric authentication has some problems. Uh, first is that the MAC function is MD5 of key append message. Uh, given the currently supported vocabulary of extension fields that we implement, uh, there is nothing particularly interesting you can do with length of extension attacks. Uh, so this isn't completely the end of the world, but it's certainly not good. Uh, the case around replay protection is dubious. Uh, the basic mechanism for replay protection is the origin timestamp. Uh, the client sends out T1 in the, in the transmit timestamp field of its request. The server copies that value back into the origin timestamp field of its, re of its response, uh, and the client verifies that the two match, that the, that the response matches the request. Uh, but if the client's clock is fast and has to be stepped backwards, then there's a danger that an origin timestamp will be reused. Uh, same goes if multiple clients are configured to use the same key, um, which among the, few, among the few deployments which actually use authentication at all is, fa is fairly common because administrators are lazy. Um, it's possible to use random values in place of real timestamps if you want, since all we're doing with this is just, ch is just checking for a match. Um, but since they're only 64 bits long, the birthday bound there gets uncomfortable. Uh, also, if you're operating in symmetric mode, then the initial request of a session always, ha always has an origin timestamp of zero, um, and in broadcast mode, the origin timestamp is always zero. Um, so these modes are more severely vulnerable to replay compared to client-server mode. Uh, the same MAC key gets used in both directions. Uh, in the client-server topology, this is okay, because client packets are clearly distinguished from server packets by a difference in their mode field. Um, but as I mentioned, in symmetric configurations, uh, you may have mode one packets going in both directions, which means the packets sent in one direction can then be replayed in the other direction. Um, also, symmetric passive servers can be flooded with replayed packets from a bunch of different spoofed IPs, which will cause them to stand up a bunch of sp spurious associations. Um, last but not least, uh, NTP has a history of disastrous bugs in its authentication code. Um, worst is that until early 2015, uh, any packet which contained a MAC would, would be accepted as authentic. Uh, the code was verifying that, was, was verifying the MAC and setting an error flag if the MAC was invalid, but then nothing was ever actually checking the status of that flag. Uh, and if you think that one's bad. 
Uh, now, I'm going to be as gentle as I can with auto key um, because this was designed in an era where I'm not going to say nobody knew better, but nobody knew very much. Um, this was a few years before anybody noticed that Needham Schroeder was broken. Uh, it well predates SSL, um, but with that proviso, when Harlan said stop using it, he was giving sound advice. Uh, so. Um, at this point, a lot, a lot of you are probably wondering why NTP has to be such a snowflake. Uh, why can't we just tunnel it through DTLS and call it a day? Uh, well, first let's address a few specious answers to that question which come up often. Um, first, there's the issue I mentioned earlier about how an adversary can influence time estimates by delaying packets. Uh, but that's not a problem that some protocol other than DTLS is actually going to solve. Uh, the best answer here is, just going, is to just continue computing error bounds, that lambda statistic that I mentioned, uh, at the application layer just like we do it today. Um, another specious objection is that before we have correct time, we won't be able to tell if an X509 certificate offered by the server is expired. Um, but again, there is no magic solution here that we'll be able to achieve uh, by, by avoiding DTLS. Uh, the best we can do is to reject any time response uh, which would place our clock outside the, which, 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 would tip, which would tell us that the current time is something that is outside the server's, the validity window on the, on the, on the certificate that the server gave us. Um, so this won't prevent a server from hand, handing us an expired certificate and then also serving us old time, uh, but that's a threat we can mitigate against just by querying multiple servers and then rejecting any outliers, uh, which is something that NTP already supports and has for a long time. Um, a third objection is that DTLS can't deal with broadcast mode, uh, which is true enough, um, but I have a really simple answer to that one, which is don't use broadcast mode. Uh, there is, there's, just no, there's just no good motivation for it. Um, but finally, we come to an objection that can't be dismissed so easily, uh, which is that it's really important to allow NTP servers to be stateless, and let's talk about why this is. Uh, NTP scales a lot differently than, say, a web server does. Uh, any given client generates very little traffic, uh, not even four packets per hour. Uh, but NTP servers typically serve a massive number of clients. Uh, we're talking to, we're, we may be talking tens of millions in some cases, like the NIST servers, um, which means that if we need to hold even a small amount of state for every client that has a session open, uh, we're going to come under memory pressure long before we come under CPU pressure. So with all that said, uh, let's talk about what we're doing to fix this mess. Uh, so network time security is an IETF effort aimed at replacing auto key. Um, it's been in progress for several years. Uh, Dieter and Christoph and Steven were the original authors. Um, I came into the picture about six months ago with what was originally a competing proposal, um, but as of the last IETF summit, um, we've now joined forces and we have a joint draft in progress. Uh, now, one thing that both NTS author teams figured out pretty early on uh, is that there's no single approach that's going to be workable for all of NTP's different operating modes. Uh, the biggest friction point uh, is the conflict between the need for statelessness in some modes and the need for mutual replay protection in others. Now, obviously, you can't have both of these things at the same time, uh, since you, if, if you aren't willing to update your state in response to receiving an acceptable packet, then if that packet comes in a second time, then you'll be in the same state as before, which means you're going to accept that packet a second time as well. Um, now, fortunately, no NTP mode requires us to do the impossible and provide both these things simultaneously, uh, but nonetheless, we do need to do, di do different things for different modes. Um, symmetric and control modes are relatively easy. Uh, we do need mutual replay protection. There isn't enough fan out for us to care about statelessness, so plain old DTLS pretty much suits our needs perfectly. Uh, the spec for how to do this is literally a couple of paragraphs. Uh, but for client-server mode, which is what virtually everybody actually uses, we need to do a little bit more work. Uh, now, we can still do an unmodified TLS handshake. Uh, this will require the server to hold state for one round trip while the handshake is in progress. Um, but as long as the state can be discarded immediately afterwards and not have to be held for the entire, for the entire duration of the, of the client session, which can, be day, which can be days or weeks or months, um, then that's acceptable. Um, in that case, even an implausibly busy server is going to have at most a couple megabytes of state re uh, related to handshakes. Um, but using DTLS for application data in this case isn't going to cut it. So here's our solution for client-server mode. Uh, we do a TLS handshake on a separate port. 
Um, after that handshake, we exchange one volley of TLS application data to negotiate an AEAD algorithm and to send the client a supply of cookies. Uh, now, the choice of AEAD algorithms is a little bit delicate here um, because in some deployments, uh, particularly ones that involve load balanced clusters um, or VM images that might get snapshot and restored, um, it can be very difficult to avoid accidental knots reuse. Um, so the mandatory to implement algorithm we chose uh, for, the RFs, for, the, uh, for the Internet Graft um, is uh, AES SIV CMAC, um, which, gives us, uh, which gives us resistance to, uh, ac to accidental reuse. Um, also, the uh, CFRG is currently working on a new proposal called AES GCM SIV, um, which provides the same sort of misuse resistance properties, um, but, but also provides much better performance. Um, and at such time as that draft becomes an RFC, uh, we'll start encouraging implementers to, negoti to negotiate that instead. Uh, the cookies function a lot like TLS session tickets. Uh, they contain some information that the server encrypts and authenticates to itself, um, which the client stores on the server's behalf and sends back later so that the server can, can resume the session without the server having to retain anything in the interim. Um, also, just like TLS session tickets, uh, there's a privacy problem here. Um, if the client sends back the cookie multiple times, then that will enable a passive adversary to track the client as it moves between networks. Um, that's undesirable, so we avoid it by having the server provide the client with a fresh cookie for every request. Uh, the cookie gets sent to the client encrypted, but then sent back in the clear, uh, so that the adversary won't be able to link the two legs of the transaction. Uh, this is perfectly analogous to how TLS 1.3 deals with session tickets. Um, but supporting these privacy goals in NTS is a little pointless if they're being violated at the NTP layer. Um, and as for that, well, I'll let this slide speak for itself. Um, since uh, Professor Goldberg and her student uh, Ancha Malhotra are both here, I'd like to uh, thank them both, um, respectively, first for, for pushing us to get, to get this work done, and uh, to Ancha for being my co-author on this draft. Um, I'm, I'm going to be really happy when we get this nonsense cleaned up. Uh, let me uh, wrap up this talk with a quick shout out for Rough Time, uh, which is a separate effort that Adam Langley has been spearheading. Uh, now, Rough Time is not NTP at all. It's a completely different protocol with different goals. And as its name implies, high precision is not one of those goals. Um, what it provides in exchange is better ability to ensure that servers are behaving correctly. Um, now, all along, NTP has supported the ability to weed out servers that are serving bad time, uh, so-called false techers. Uh, from any majority click of so-called true chimers. Um, but the limitation of NTP, whether you're securing it with NTS or with any of the legacy authentication mechanisms, um, is that conversation transcripts are repudiable. Uh, so the client won't be able to prove to a third party uh, that the false tickers are false ticking, and that's what rough time solves. Um, and if we can ever get to the point where the usual behavior for clients is that they first um, set their time using rough time and then do, then do their fine tuning using NTS authenticated NTP, um, that would be a very nice world and I hope we get there in the next few years. Um, so with that, I'll uh, wrap it up and take questions. So uh, we do have time for a couple of questions. Um, you have. Hi, um, I just wanted to um, acknowledge other people that have been working on this design um, that weren't mentioned on the slides. So um, there's a whole bunch of people actually working on the from the ITF. So I just wanted to mention some of their names who've been doing some of this work. So there's Harlan Sten, there's Danny Mayer, Miroslav Lichtvar, Aritz Saltz. Um, I just want to make sure I get everyone. Kyle Rose, me, Anshul Manhotra, and I hope I didn't forget anyone else. So this is actually a big team, um, and all of this stuff is happening now, so it would be very, very exciting to get input from this community on this work. So I'm really glad that Daniel got the chance to present this work here. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I th um, there, there are, yeah, the, 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 as, as uh, Professor Goldberg mentioned, uh, there's, there's actually quite, there's quite a cast who's been involved at least a little bit here. Um, uh, so uh, I can't come up with all of them off the top of my head either. Uh, look for the uh, contributors section at the end of the uh, draft. <laughs> uh, 
You were mentioning that this is connected to DNSSEC. Uh, one thing I'm observing is that a lot of people seem to sign their DNSSEC records for, for a year in some cases. Mm -hmm. I find this somewhat surprising. Just uh, a couple of days ago, I noticed state.gov is issuing one-year DNSSEC signatures. Uh, it seems a little long for uh, most purposes, so don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is it really too slow to just sign the, the responses? Uh, yes. Um. OK. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is, this something that, is this something that the NTP pool can use, or is it going to be administratively prohibitive for them to use it? Um, so uh, that, that's, that's something that um, we're still in the very early phases of addressing. Um, by early phases, I mean I sent one email about that out to the uh, working group list and uh, haven't heard any responses yet. Um, but um, e yeah, uh, uh, having, this, having this supported by pool servers is going to be a little bit more challenging um, than, if you've, that, than if, you've spe if you've specifically configured what servers you want to talk to. Um, because uh, it will probably require some um, some means of of ha ha having having somebody who who owns a CA private key um, that you, uh, who's uh, that you trust and and having them basically accredit uh, people that you trust to serve you valid time. Um, so um, this is this is again something that uh, that I hope rough time can help us with um, because that will help us spot people whose accredit whose accreditation accreditation needs to go away. Um, but uh, yeah, this is this this is very much an open problem. Okay. All right. So let's thank Daniel again.